Welcome back. Today we're reacting to some more Kurzgesagt in a nutshell. Today we have Quantum Computers Explained the Limits of Human Technology. Quantum computing is something that I know a little bit about. I wouldn't say I'm anywhere near an expert on the topic, but I dabble here and there. I am a network engineer by trade, so I deal with computers and the internet at large a lot, but not quantum computers, but I know of it. Let's dive right in and learn together. For most of our history, human technology consisted of our brains, fire, and sharp sticks. It's true. While fire and sharp sticks became power plants and nuclear weapons, <laughs> the biggest upgrade has A happened big to jump our brains. There. Since the 1960s, the power of our brain machines has kept growing exponentially, allowing computers to get mm -hmm. smaller and more powerful at the same time. Our brain machines. But this process is about to I like its that. physical limits. Computer parts are approaching the size Although, of an atom. We've been saying computing is going to reach its physical limits for a really long time. And every time we get close, someone miraculously finds a way to make it smaller. Now, logically, there has to be a limit. There has to be a lower limit. And when we're approaching the size of an atom, there's a problem with the electronics that becomes an issue. And that is that electricity will arc over a certain distance regardless of how you how you do it at such a small level like there is a limitation on how small you can have something that is unconductive to actually stop electrical bleed i'm explaining that horribly and i know i am i'm sorry but from that perspective there is a hard physical limit and we're actually approaching that but there may be creative ways around it let's see to understand why this is a problem we have to clear up some basics Dun, dun, dun. A computer is made up of very simple components doing yeah. very simple things, Educate representing us. data, the means of processing it, and control mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Computer chips contain modules, Our brain contain machines. logic gates, which contain transistors. A transistor is the simplest form of a data processor in computers, basically a switch that can either block or open the way for information coming through. This information yep. is made up of bits, which can be set to either zero or one. Combinations of several bits are used to represent more complex information. Random fact of the day. A group of eight bits is called a byte. I think that's fairly common knowledge. But, and this is real, I swear to God, four bits or half of a byte is called a nibble. <laughs> it's true. I'm not pulling your leg. It's true. Transistors are combined to create logic gates, which still do very simple stuff. For example, an AND gate sends an output of 1 if all of its inputs are 1, and an output of 0 otherwise. Combinations of and logic you can gates do this all mechanically. form meaningful modules, say for adding two numbers. Once you can add, you can also multiply, and once you can multiply, you can basically do anything. Since yeah. all basic operations are literally simpler than first grade math, you can imagine a computer as a group of mm -hmm. seven-year-olds answering really basic <laughs> math questions. That's a good analogy. A large enough bunch of them could compute anything from astrophysics to Zelda. However, with parts getting tiny, it's the combination, tinier, the grouping, are making things that makes tricky. the difference. In a nutshell, a transistor is just an electric switch. Electricity is electrons moving from one place to another, so a switch is a passage that can block electrons from moving in one direction. Today, a typical scale for transistors is 14 nanometers, oh, which is, is about tiny. eight times less than the HIV virus's diameter and 500 times smaller than a red blood cells. As That's transistors are shrinking small. to the size of only a few atoms, electrons may just transfer themselves to the other side of a blocked passage mm -hmm. via a process called quantum, quantum tunneling. tunneling. Yes. In the quantum realm, okay. physics works quite differently from yeah, the kind of know what I'm talking about. To, and traditional computers just stop making sense. Mm -hmm. We are approaching a real physical barrier for our technological progress. To solve this problem, scientists are trying to use these unusual quantum properties to their advantage by building quantum computers. Hey, you can't change In it. In normal computers, bits are the smallest units of information. Quantum computers use qubits, qubits, which can also be set to one of two values. A qubit can be any two-level quantum system, such as a spin in a magnetic field or a single photon. Zero and one are this system's possible states, like the photon's horizontal or vertical polarization. 
In the quantum world, the qubit doesn't have to be in just one of those. It can be in any proportions of both states at once. We have to talk for just a second about how ingenious this is. The people that came up with this concept and actually built it. <laughs> wow. This is called superposition. But as soon as you test its value, say by sending the photon through a filter, it has to decide to be either vertically or horizontally polarized. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's unobserved, the qubit is in a superposition of probabilities for zero and one, and you can't predict which it will be. But the instant you measure it, it and collapses this is physical, into one of the definite states. Not theoretical. That's an important distinction. Is a game changer. Four classical bits can be in one of two to the power of four different configurations at a time. That's 16 possible combinations, out of which you can use just one. Four qubits in superposition, however, can be in all of those 16 combinations at once. <laughs> this number grows exponentially with each extra qubit. 20 of them can already store a million values in parallel. Yep. A really weird and unintuitive property qubits can have is entanglement, a close connection that makes each of the qubits react to a change in the other's state instantaneously, no matter how far they are apart. Entanglement is absolutely mind-blowing. I think because this video is about seven years old at the time that I'm watching this right now, and I believe within the last, I don't know, maybe two years or so, maybe even sooner than that, it's 2023 right now, but pretty recently, after this video was made, there was actually a Nobel Peace Prize given for a group of scientists who were able to prove, and I don't, I don't fully understand how, it is way beyond my understanding of quantum mechanics, <laughs> but they were able to prove that the entangled properties are not predetermined, okay? So when you entangle a pair of particles, it does not predetermine the outcome. But then they were also able to determine that there is no extra information when you basically break that entanglement and read the values, right? If, if one end of that pair is spin up, the other end of that pair is always spin down. They're always opposite. And basically, it has some pretty crazy implications. One of those implications is causality itself could potentially be at issue <laughs> because you, you know cause and effect how can you have an effect that happens potentially faster than light can travel away from the cause that's a problem now the argument to that the counter argument is that it maybe does not break causality because there's not actually any useful information you cannot influence the outcome of that measurement, right? You just know if you measure this on one side that the opposite side is going to be opposite. That doesn't allow you to communicate faster than light. That doesn't exchange any useful or usable data faster than light. So causality may still remain intact, but that was a really big recent finding. Another thing that's really influenced quantum computers is they've found more recently, I don't think they've actually deployed it and used it in real life, but they've found recently a much more effective way to generate entangled particles at higher temperatures. So that way we don't need as crazy low temperatures for operation and we can have more qubits, drastically more qubits at a time. So this video is a little dated in that respect. You know, there, there's more potential now even than there was back then. But it's still a really cool topic. This means that when measuring just one entangled qubit, you can directly deduce properties of its partners without having to look. Qubit manipulation is a mind bender as well. A normal logic gate gets a simple set of inputs and produces one definite output. Yep. A quantum gate manipulates an input of superpositions, rotates probabilities, and produces another superposition as its output. So a quantum computer sets up some qubits, applies quantum gates to entangle them and manipulate probabilities, mm -hmm. and finally measures the outcome, collapsing superpositions to an actual sequence of zeros and ones. Yep. What this means is that you get the entire lot of calculations that are possible with your setup all done at the same time. Kind of mind-blowing. You can only measure one of the results, and it will only probably be the one you want, so you may have to double-check and try again. 
It's a different beast but by than traditional computing. Position and entanglement, this can be exponentially more efficient than would ever be possible on a normal computer. This is especially useful when it comes to encryption. To breaking encryption, I should say. Because when you do encryption on computers, the things that secures your username and passwords and all your banking data and all that stuff, when you're doing that, your key, your computer is generating a key based off of a public key that the other end shared. And basically that's a crazy, crazy mathematical function um, for verification. But what happens a lot of the times is it's using exponents in those calculations. So a computer can very easily say um, 17 to the power of 23 is this value, right? That's something it can do very easily. However, you can't take the resulting number of that, which is a very large number, and you can't say, give me the numbers that are, you know, plug in A and B for uh, this to the power of that, right? A to the power of B. Give me all those possible numbers for this end result. That is something that traditional computers struggle with a lot. And that would be an example, although very simplified, of how you would break encryption on a computer. Quantum computations, because of this property that they're talking about here, are insanely way better at breaking encryption because they can hit those results a lot faster. So while quantum computers will probably not replace our home computers, in some areas they are mm -hmm. vastly superior. Also, this music well, reminds me of Legend of Zelda. To find something in a database, a normal computer may have to test every single one of its entries. Quantum algorithms need only the square root of that time, which for large databases mm -hmm. is a huge difference. Yeah. The most famous use of quantum computers is ruining IT security. <laughs> right there now, we go. Browsing email and banking data is being kept secure by an encryption system in which you give everyone a public key to encode messages only you can decode. Yep, so this is what the we were just talking about. This public key can actually be used to calculate your secret private key. Luckily, doing the necessary math on any normal computer would literally take years of trial and error. But mm -hmm. a quantum computer with exponential speed up could do it in a breeze. Another yeah, really exciting it's scary. use is simulations. Simulations of the quantum world are very intense on resources, and even for bigger structures such as molecules, they often lack accuracy. So mm -hmm. why not simulate quantum physics with actual quantum physics? Quantum simulations could provide new insights on proteins yeah, that might revolutionize same. medicine. Protein right folding now, was another big quantum one. Quantum computers will be just a very specialized tool or a big revolution for humanity. They were able to find... Uh, what was it? Some sort of antibiotics using quantum computations because the protein folding is insanely, insanely complex and it takes a crazy amount of time on a traditional computer to the point where it's, you know, you might as well not even bother. But quantum, <laughs> it's crazy. And then you take some of the power of quantum computations and you combine it with AI and machine learning. I mean, we, we've made so many discoveries just in the last couple of years on those topics. It's it's absolutely mind-blowing. We've done decades worth of research in the last two years using these technologies. And we've had the breakthroughs. It's crazy. We have no idea where the limits of technology are, and there's only one way to find out. This video is supported by the Australian... <laughs> That was amazing, man. Wow. I love these guys. This is an older video, but it's still really well done. And that music, I I love the music. It really is giving me strong Legend of Zelda vibes, like the old school Super NES days. It's great. <laughs> but yeah, quantum computing, it's crazy. A lot of people, I feel, have the misconception that quantum computing is the future of technology for the home. You're never going to have a quantum computer in your house. I, I very highly doubt that. But what we will see is quantum computing being used in research fields, being used in cybersecurity, being used in simulations. I can't wait to see where it goes. Anyway, if you like this video, do me a favor. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It helps me a ton. I appreciate you, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Have a good one.